sorry to interrupt our discussions, everyone, but we're going to make a start with the second session today. Um, so I would like to introduce uh, Eamon Shenouda, who will be talking to us about the role of rural health teams in addressing drought. Okay, good day. I'm Eamon Shenouda. Uh, uh, I'm a GP in Wagga Wagga. I've been in Wagga for 20 years. And uh, I have to tell you, it's, uh, the, the talking about drought today, when I first went to Wagga uh, uh, about 20 years, this was the start of a drought of 12 years. I don't know whether people remember that, but it was really very dry for 12 years. And now we are getting into another bout of drought in, in Wagga in New South Wales, uh, which is uh, very close. Hopefully this time we won't stay for another 12 years. But it just shows how recurrent drought is and it's just becoming more often, uh, but also the long term of drought and the effects of that is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about planning for drought and uh, planning in advance to drought, but I'm also going to give some examples that things that we did in uh, Wagga to deal with uh, drought and things that we can do in the future using other uh, health providers. So as you can see in the map, the, the, the New South Wales is affected normally uh, north, uh, uh, where South East uh, Queensland, uh, also and, and Victoria uh, is, 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 is the areas that are normally affected with droughts. So obviously with long term drought, it does affect uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, rural communities and farmers. Uh, the effect of that on farmers is uh, mental health issues that if you have heard Mr. Uh, Sir Harry in there, so mental health issues, isolation, uh, keeping with uncertainty or dealing with uncertainty and not knowing what's going to happen next uh, can create into, get into drugs, get into alcohol, get into uh, suicide and the uh, rate of suicide rate in, uh, among farmers uh, is higher simply also it's because it's accessible so every farmer would have a, an arm you know a, 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 a gun somewhere uh, and uh, and uh, I, I heard this story quite often they're just looking at uh, the arm cupboard uh, and and thinking of doing something about it uh, in ending their life so obviously we need to think about uh, that in more depth and, uh, and, and we need to think about drought planning. So the first is to identify vulnerable population and that can be difficult with the uh, health uh, disparities uh, uh, in Australia and different uh, set of rural communities. So it can be uh, very difficult, but we need to, I think health professionals in general and uh, rural, uh, rural uh, fire service, uh, uh, CWAs, all of those uh, people uh, working uh, in, uh, around rural need to be involved in the decision making and into planning to the future. They are closer to what's happening on the ground. They need to be uh, informed and be part of the solution for the future. Uh, the other thing is uh, disease projection, so uh, we need to project uh, what's uh, going to happen and get ready for it uh, earlier on, uh, population health, looking at that. And again, try to involve GPs and, and other health providers into that is crucial for the future. Planning for specific disease, and uh, we know that uh, there are specific diseases that are uh, airborne uh, uh, because of uh, airborne diseases for respiratory. People have got chronic obstructive airway disease or asthma. This can be really uh, exacerbated in, in drought time because of the dust and the drought, but also waterborne. People are using uh, stored water and other kinds of water, and I heard about problems <laughs> with water before, so, so this is very important also. But also the main one is uh, also mental health. So, uh, and how to, to discuss this. One of the, how to address this. One of the big issues is that there's a recent study that saw that one third of, of, uh, of people in these circumstances in extreme, uh, to moderate to extreme mental health uh, problems, uh, one third of them are not accessing uh, health. And that becomes a problem in, in rural Australia in general. Farmers are very resilient. It's a taboo to go and talk about your mental health. Uh, they always bl blame themselves for it and they want to deal with it themselves and they don't seek health professionals. And sometimes 
this is a huge problem. So in addressing this, we need to have some solutions to how can we approach them rather. Again, intervention strategies, we need to sort of think of how we're gonna address all of that with, with some intervention uh, strategies to look at uh, ways to first to support farmers on the long term, so having some uh, resilience and have some other ideas, uh, small businesses that they can actually generate some money in time of drought. So we need to think about things like strategies to support the farms in the time of drought when it's not drought rather than just jump into things when the drought happened and then having some funding, but there wasn't any strategies or anything in place for the farmers to adopt and, and have some resilience and, and dealing with the drought period. So that's very important. Again, as I said before, I just we need to engage with the other people uh, in the community that are doing services, uh, that knows the community, that been dealing with the community to be addressing the drought. I'm gonna talk next about some few things that we've done in Wagga, and that was in the period where I had to face as a GP. I was working in Wagga, but also have a, a, a practice in the Rock. Uh, that's about 25 uh, uh, minutes out of Wagga, but it is a, mainly a farming community that I looked after and I had to you know, face some issues that I needed to address. So one of the things that we, I just don't want to run out of time, is, is this uh, in, in uh, conjunction with the Division of General Practice where I was then a member of, on its board, we come up with some strategies to get out of general practice and go and, and talk to farmers where they could be. And one of the things was a, a, a pub presentation in the pub, so most of the farmers will go to the pub. Uh, and what's interesting about this is that y y you find out that people might be, uh, you have 10 pe people in, in the area where you're presenting, but there's others sitting on the bar, and you think that they are not giving any you know, attention about what we're doing, but next week in the clinic, they will knock on your door and say, oh, I heard your presentation, oh, I couldn't recognize your face, it's like I was sitting on the bar. So, so sometimes actually going to the areas where things are happening and uh, not necessarily having a big bunch of people sitting in front of you, but they spread the word and, and just going there and talking about health issues, talking about uh, accessibility, talking about trust, talking about coming in here, just, it's, it doesn't have to be medicine, it's just come and we'll have a discussion, uh, say hello <laughs> and, and have, have this interaction happening is very important. Another thing that uh, actually worked also, and we have got the Henty Field Day, uh, a lot of people would be aware of that. We started a project again with the division, and that was in combination with allied health professionals, nurses, uh, medical students love it too, so we got them engaged into that, going up for the day, having a pit stop, uh, check up, checkups, regular checkups, and referring, uh, uh, you know, and again, having a chat, how are you going, things must be tough, how, how can we help you there? Uh, and but also having your cholesterol checked and having your blood sugar checked and your blood, uh, blood pressure checked, refer you back to the community and we have some study to follow up the farmers. So it's not enough to just address the issue on the pit uh, on, on the day, but maybe making sure that they went to their JP, making sure that they are following up things and getting them more oriented with what general practice is and how friendly it is and it's not a, just a scary thing and actually we are all the same, <laughs> we need to have a discuss, you're not bulletproof, uh, we are all into it together. Uh, this is something that affected our community and we need to address it together. Uh, interesting telehealth has uh, been an initiative that's been put by the government uh, recently and, uh, and uh, uh, I just uh, was talking to a, a friend of mine uh, uh, about how we're using this and he, he's a friend uh, in up in north where there's flooding. So uh, that's where uh, he, he lives uh, in North Queensland and there was a massive flooding in the last uh, uh, months or so and uh, he actually uh, uh, he is a reach out doctor so he would reach out with a plane out to the communities that are struggling. Uh, he will do some consultation for people who are desperate for consultation but he thought that's a good initial uh, interaction between the GP and the patient and then he can use the telehealth as a follow-up 
concentration. So, 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 so giving them the idea there is the option of telehealth and the option of, of consulting with your doctor. Quite often, uh, as a GP in a rural community, like you would see a lot of the community uh, in, in the time you serve them. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's this option of you don't have to go to the consulting room and having the option of if you don't have time, you're already you know, uh, bothered with all the things that you are doing to address a very significant uh, stress in your life. Maybe you just have a chat on, on, a, on a video conference. I think it's a good uh, 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 initiative, and I think uh, hopefully GPs will adopt them. And as I said, it's a, a lot better when it's a, a follow-up rather than initial. You need this personal touch in the initial consultation to be uh, effective. And, uh, and we, as GPs also, we train our registrars to how to build this confidence and trust from the first consultation is part of the main part of general practice, actually, because sometimes people are coming for very trivial things, but in the time they spend with the GPs, that's where they have a relationship and establish a relationship of trust and a relationship of, I'm here to hear you. I'm not here just to to look after your medication or measure your blood pressure. I'm here to, you know, uh, and a lot of patients say, I don't like this doctor because he doesn't talk about what's up here. So patients love actually, but they want someone to initiate the discussion, to be there for them and feel like they are they are very close to them in their suffering time. So the college have got uh, also uh, a, a, a process where we actually try to skill rural GPs, upskill them with uh, mental health. So we've got uh, the Fire GP, which is a fellowship of. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, advanced training in the rural community, which we are changing to the FRSHP RG, which is the rural journalist. You heard about the rural journalism a lot, so we are changing and getting into this uh, rural journalist sphere. But what this is about is about training rural GPs uh, and uh, ad advancing their skills. A lot of them want to advance their skills uh, in, 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 in addressing the needs of their community. Mental health and palliative care is on top of the list now, okay? So we were talking before about uh, procedural skills like anesthetics or obstetrics and emergency, which are still there and still needed by the communities. But we're finding that mental health and, uh, and palliative care are really uh, up there. Age care is another issue that needs to be addressed a bit more thoroughly. And, and so we design uh, an additive skill to the GP. So the core is a fellowship of, uh, of the Rural Australian College of General Practice. Then we have another year of a skill or having uh, you know trained in a skill or upskill you in a skill that will address the needs of your community, which works very well. Uh, and some doctors actually will do not one skill, so they might do the emergency skill and the palliative care skill. And it's very interesting that even the doctors will change to the needs of the community. When I started in Nova, uh, I had a surgical background. Doctors kept referring things to me to do uh, cancer things, but the patient perception of me was a dermatologist. And I wasn't a dermatologist, and uh, my idea of dermatology was basic. So what I did is uh, I went and did a diploma in dermatology and upskilled myself. So I feel very comfortable in addressing their needs. But also it gave me a niche, and patients kept coming back. Now there are three dermatologists in Waga, so I'm thinking of doing palliative care. So uh, because we don't have a palliative care physician, so rural doctors are always engaging with their community, all of them wanting to know what's going on out there and ways to address it. We want to get this into two folds. One fold is strategic fold of thinking about how we do this, which we talked about earlier, but also, you know, solution that comes from the ground. The PHN, I was talking to them uh, recently, and Carl is on the PHN board, uh, uh, but we're talking about drought. We've got some money for drought, so we're going back to those does visiting the communities and trying to do uh, something there and uh, so uh, and trying to address the needs in there with different models it's not only i want to sit in my room and everyone would come to me we need to go out there use social workers more understand what the community is about and try to engage with them in a better deal i'm finished i'm very quick yes we also have the 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 
this other uh, the disaster or emergency response planning tool that is used by uh, just getting general practice to be ready for a response, so get things in place to do that. And uh, it's a very good tool that's utilized by GPs uh, to address that or any uh, national disaster. I'm very happy to take any question if I have time. Yep. Five minutes, yeah. excellent. I'm quick. <laughs>